thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We are excited to have this conversation around the role of leadership of intermediaries in leadership communities. And this actually came out of some feedback that we got at the conference about an interest in um, organizing roundtables or meetings for folks that play similar roles. And you know, as network organizers, we've learned that in order for progress to move forward in a community, it's really important to have someone who's behind the scenes sort of helping lead the work and holding the vision and keeping it moving forward. And we've also had uh, a few people, a few um, new people who are interested in joining the network and, and, and a very brand new member, um, Belvedere. So I wanted to create this opportunity uh, to hear from leadership communities, three very different communities and an opportunity for folks to really ask questions and learn from one another. So the goals for today are to hear from three leadership communities about what they've learned in convening partners from diverse sectors and you know, to achieve their shared goals, how they've adjusted efforts in light of COVID-19 and strategies they use to advance equity. And as I said, we want this to really be an opportunity for communities to ask questions and learn from one another. So it's fairly informal. And I'm very excited to introduce our speakers, uh, Nancy, Avia Cech from uh, the Executive Director of the Northwest Education Council for Student Success, Anisha Grumet, the Executive Director of Alignment Rockford, and Dr. Daryl Hogue, the Superintendent of Riverbend um, School District 2. And I will now turn it over to Nancy to lead us in, to start us off in the conversation. Thanks, Nancy. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Nancy of Jacek, the executive director of Nexus. And I always have to check my own name when I write in that chat too, because it always gives me the red line underneath it. So I always double check it just to make sure. <laughs> um, so Nexus is the regional partnership between districts 211, 214, 220, and Harper College. We're a community, an organization that serves 23 communities throughout the Northwest suburbs. Um, you can see kind of our group of um, educational entities. And then Nexus's office is myself and my assistant director. And we often represent the voice of our region from the educational perspective on um, in non-for-profit groups like United Palatine or with our, um, our business partnership groups like GCAMP, we have a regional manufacturing group. So we sit at that table and represent our region, um, connecting them to the different work that we do and the different needs that they have, we connect them to the right people within our community. Um, you can see I, we have a breakdown of our, um, of our demographics, but really on the next slide is what I would wanna talk about. We've, this has really been the impetus for a lot of our work. You can see on this, on this map, there's on the left-hand side is our free and reduced lunch um, eligibility from 2005, 2006. And then you can see on the right hand side, 10 years later, just how many more, um, how much more eligibility and how much more spread out throughout the region that it is. And that's really been at the heart of a lot of our work. So on the left hand side, we have, um, oh, we'll start that train. okay, we have the, um, that is our organizational chart. And that's really at the core of our success is that is that um, organizational chart. And what that really represents is that the vision and the mission for our work starts at the very top um, at the board level where we have the superintendents from the districts and the president of the college. And then really the, the, um, the work is driven at the, at the council level in coordination with our office. And then the work is really done at our committee and task force level. So I think that, that um, I think that that's a unique, but it's a that's really the most important part of our organization is that organizational chart. So if you take nothing else from me, I think that's our, that's what I would hope you um, take away from here. So I always joke and say that I'm just here to keep the train on the tracks. Um, that's really the what my job is. Uh, but also I try to keep the focus on the work, keep everybody coming back to the table, and 
it's important. There's a lot of work that we do that really only doesn't that doesn't include all of the members. But we, we always make sure that everybody has a seat at the table because even work that isn't necessarily um, directly impacted by one organization, it's important that they're there in the spirit of the partnership, if that makes sense. Um, so even if we're talking about a secondary um, initiative, there's always somebody from Harper at the table because somehow they're going to be indirectly impacted at some point. Um, so. A lot of times I have to be the cheerleader and remind people just how great we are doing because they're these are super high achieving organizations and they tend to get caught up in the what's going wrong instead of the what's going right. And uh, making sure everybody continuously is rowing in the same direction. And sometimes I believe it or not, not everybody agrees all the time. And so it's always my job to get people back to the table when we're not all agreeing and keep people coming back until we get it figured out. So some of the things, and most of this were my lessons um, coming into this organization, because this was just a very different, um, I think, a different way of doing things than I was used to coming from a, a district. And one of the most important lessons is that the leadership really has to be invested in the work because they, um, if they are invested and they deem this work important, then everybody that falls underneath them comes to the table we have very few meetings that are missed because they, the people that participate in our partnership know that they are, um, that it's important because it's important to their leaders. So I think that's the first thing. Um, secondly, having the right people at the table. So our committees are all organized and whoever is placed on that committee by their organization is empowered to make decisions in that role. So there's never I, okay, I won't say never. There's rarely a, I have to go back and check before we can move forward with this because we don't, we try to be very, um, to streamline meetings and not have meetings just for the sake of meetings. So we make sure that we have um, people that can make the decision so we don't have to meet as often. Also uh, making sure that you have common language and definitions. And this is really important um, when we talked about our data dashboard, which is one of the successes that I'll, I'll show you later. Um, but making sure that everybody is measuring the same thing because across regions, across districts, especially high achieving districts, we, everyone wants to be represented in the best light. So we all have to make sure that we're measuring the same, the same data, even if we call it different things. Also working with the college, there's a lot of, there's a lot of communication clarifications that have to go on between the post-secondary and secondary. We tend to have each have our own dialect and there needs to be a translator. So I often work in the, that role as well. Um, we've had a lot of turnover um, in our leadership in the last, since I've been here, so the last three years. And one of our lessons has really been to systemize our work. And I'll talk about how we did that later to withstand those leadership changes. And then having three, four high achieving um, partners, we really had to start thinking about how do we recognize and celebrate the different, the different organizations, right? Because we're all kind of started different places. Everybody's on a different, no one's starting at the same exact spot. We all are kind of starting the race at different points. And so we make sure to recognize um, the organizations as individuals. And then probably our biggest takeaway from a lot of this work was getting to be okay with what we can and can't do regionally. You know, we just had to be okay with, we weren't gonna be able to do everything as a region. Some things we're gonna to have to do individually, celebrate and work hard on the things that we can do regionally, and then just be okay with, with knowing that it doesn't have to all be done regionally. So first was we, we gave ourselves some grace. We kind of looked at what we were trying to do and what, what our goals were for the year. And we kind of said, well, what what can we still do in light of COVID? What are we able to move forward with and what do we have to kind of just like expand our timelines? Um, because we did have reduced bandwidth across the organizations for sure. So for an example, we were working on work-based learning on external um, work-based learning. With the shutdown and companies being in trouble, we, we said, what can we do with this? So we turned it, um, back towards doing work um, team-based challenges and where we really did a lot of the work internally and then we can reach out to business partners to do more of a mentorship instead of trying to do this big external work-based learning push. Um, our office tried to do a lot of the heavy lifting as far as like just have, trying to do most of the work and having our partners review our work instead of giving it to them to give back to us um, because we knew that they were stretched very thin and 
we tried, oh, all of our organizations really handled the, the pandemic differently. Like um, our community college is still not in person at all. Whereas the high schools have been in person in one way or another since the beginning of the school year. So staff being offsite, meeting in person, not meeting in person. Um, we really tried to make sure that everybody was accommodated. Um, and then going forward in organizing our, our meetings going forward, we're really looking forward to kind of harnessing the energy of being back together. But at the same time, we're taking what we've learned from COVID and, um, and we're gonna do more of a hybrid schedule of, of meetings. So some will be in person and some will be, um, will be online. So the work of Nexus really falls under three umbrellas. We, we try and we create goals or we, we, we organize our goals under student transitions, um, regional alignment and equity for all. And all of our, our mission is to um, improve the achievement in students with a focus on underperforming student groups. Um, so just, we really try to look at everything through the lens of equity, like the power of 15, um, when it first started was all means all. Um, and that meant 15 hours of post-secondary credit for all students. That meant AP credit or dual credit meant for all. It, then in looking at the data a few years later, um, what we came to realize was that the, there was some, where we usually see gaps in um, performance or in um, participation in AP classes, we did not find those gaps um, in, in dual credit. So that was really reaffirming for our decision for the power for the um, for the power 15 initiative and Harper promise that's um, a scholarship for all regional students that's based on um, attendance and community service and um, and achievement that was really to give students that didn't um, could maybe didn't have the opportunity to go to college a way to work towards it um, where they could receive free college for at least the first two years. And that was all born out of equity. Um, our pathway endorsements, a way to build social, social capital for students through their work-based learning and through um, where we, we focus on trying to get outside resources for students who don't have transportation through other means so that they can, or in school-based opportunities so they can have um, real world experiences in the school. And then we've, we have had transitional math and we currently have a regional group of teachers and administrators working on the transitional math and we're, or transitional English and we'll be ready to go in the fall. So this is a snapshot of our, our data dashboard where we track annual um, progress on all the different indicators. This is something that drives our work and informs our decisions when we are looking at our goals. When we look at this data disaggregated, we kind of see like which partner maybe um, is doing better in different areas, and then we can leverage best practices with with the regional work. So um, it's really helpful. It's really useful information. We're we're, we're getting better at using it um, and finding new ways to use it in light of a lot of the um, like the new Perkins legislation and the um, CCRI indicators. We're finding new ways to use this this data. So. So some of the um, initiatives and accomplishments that we've been able to, um, to have because of our collective impact was the regional increase in college readiness. We've reduced um, remediation courses through our transitional courses um, and supports. We held a suburbanization of, we, can, we, are, we have not found a way to track military service yet. And the data I just got from the state also didn't have it on, have it tracked on there. So we are working on that. Um, in November of 2018, we held a suburbanization of poverty impact day where we had a, a national um, speaker come about what poverty looks like when it kind of bleeds out of the, the city into the suburban um, arena and how, how it's different for the different groups of people. It, we also did a poverty simulation and that included groups, all different partners. It included community groups. It included some legislators. It included um, educators from all different um, organizations. And it was a really powerful, um, it was a really powerful event that we are hoping to, um, to continue. Um, we've had a, the, the document on the left or the 
The graphic on the left shows the increase in post-secondary credit attainment since our Power 15 um, initiative started in 2015. We were able to do college and career pathway endorsements. Um, part of the work is our Power 15 group meets every month. So instead of all three districts coming at the community college with, with different asks, everyone's sitting at the same table. So it's a little bit more equitable. Um, they share resources, they share time, and it's, it makes it a lot easier for everybody. Uh, and then regionally, we've been able to do transitional math and English. Um, so some challenges that we've had, Marcel, please feel free to let me know if I missed any, is um, so like I said, we've had we've had a few, quite a few leadership changes in the last couple of years. We've had, we're having two superintendent changes in the last two years, two assistant superintendents, the president of the college, the provost of the college, and those are pretty high level changes um, in our organization. So a lot of what we've done is try to codify our work. And if you look at like our organizational structure, we replace names with position titles so that when a new leader comes in, they don't have to think about who is the best fit for that role. It's already in there for them. They just have to um, kind of slide whoever in there. And, and then we also try and have somebody, because we have a new superintendent this upcoming year, try and have someone who's on the board kind of serve as a, as a Nexus membership that provides institutional knowledge and some background and is kind of their go-to person when they need, um, when they have questions about Nexus. Another thing is, um, so relationships are at the core of this work, and that really has been missing during the pandemic. Obviously, we've had we have a new provost that has never been in her office because they're not on campus, um, so she's never seen her office. She's met with us on on Zoom. We have a bunch of new um, committee members, and we haven't had that um, haven't had in person meeting. And I think. Um, that there's, there's something to be said for the relational part, because when we when we hit the pandemic, we had to really deal with a lot of challenges as far as dual credit about completion, about completing certifications. We, I mean, it hit right before the end of the school year, right? So we went, that was when um, finals, that was after the withdrawal date, it was after. So we really had to um, work hard to make sure that students could complete dual credit. And I think that we were able to, um, to really do that work well because of the relationships that had already been created at that table. So there had to be a lot of trust that the, the courses were gonna be completed and that the, the, sta the standards were gonna be met. Um, and so I think that really exemplifies the relational piece for our group. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to balance four high achieving organizations um, and making sure that everybody has a voice in the work and that everybody is celebrated. And um, so we really, look, we really look for ways to celebrate each of the organizations and as a group, but we can be competitive at times. So it can be a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, those are the two I think most important is that make sure that the partners have commitment from the top because that's um, very important and then having the right people at the table. And that's at our committee and task force assignment. Um, and it's just easy to say the same position across all four. Um, the, it makes the work a lot easier, streamlined, and um, just and more impactful. Thank you, Nancy. And I think we'll just keep moving forward with the presentations and um, provide an opportunity for folks to ask questions at the end. I will now turn it over to Anisha. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anisha Grimmett, the Executive Director of Alignment Rockford, located in Rockford, Illinois, near the Wisconsin border. Um, I second everything Nancy said, so maybe my presentation will go <laughs> a lot quicker um, because everything she said, exactly. Um, you know, what everyone's kind of going through as being the role of, of an intermediary in this work, so. Next slide, please. So um, just a little bit about Alignment Rockford in these next couple of slides. Um, so we at Alignment Rockford, we're a collective impact organization. Um, and so we, you know, we are truly defined by what you see here on the left side of the page, have shared agenda, shared accountability, 
mutually reinforcing um, activities. But you know, beyond just uh, what the you know traditional definition of of collective impact organization, you know, we also uh, bring a piece of shared tactics and action plans, um, and work in direct partnership with our uh, school district for um, for implementation. Um, so we don't just you know really do this um, as a silo as a community, but we work hand in hand um, with our school district and have a continuous improvement process that kind of holds us all accountable to the work. Uh, next slide, please. Our mission um, at Alignment is to uh, align community resources that supports our Rocker Public School strategies um, and really focusing on student achievement, raising that, improving the health and happiness of our children um, and advancing social economic and social well, economic and social well-being of our community, you know, around community prosperity. Focusing on, um, you know, I said tip to tail of, of our work is increasing kindergarten readiness all the way up through increasing high, high school graduation rates. Um, once again, really emphasizing the goal of improving community prosperity through our work. And so when I say we support the public school strategies, our Rocker Public School strategies, it's tried and true. They identify, uh, our school system identifies uh, components of work that they want us to focus on and they want us to align community support around. Um, and right now, um, for the past couple of years uh, that we've been um, you know, at this work and in partnership with the school district, it's been around college and career readiness in the high school space and then early childhood. Um, so those have been our, our, our big calls, calls to charge so far. Next slide, please. And who knows, in 10 years, it'll be something else, but we're, we're always there. Um, so how we were, you know, wh why we came into existence um, about, you know, over 10 years ago, um, you know, our community recognized and our schools recognized that organizations were not working together. Um, nonprofits were working in silos. Our school system was working in silos and no one was really working together for the common and greater good of our students and our overall community health. Um, at that time, the school district itself, you know, you know, 36% of the students were college ready, 64% were not college ready. Um, but yet, uh, and then a third of those as well, you know, weren't even, um, you know, graduating. So we really had a weak pet pipeline of talent at that time. But then also at that time, the employer demand um, for, um, you know, uh, people who had a certain level of education required needed for the jobs um, was much needed, but the talent, the local talent just couldn't meet those demands. So a local philanthropist actually, you know, connected with other folks and said, we got to do something. How can we help the schools? How can we build trust with the schools and develop a better relationship and stronger relationship that'll help us and you know, employers where, you know, also, you know, improve our community as well as uplifting lives. And so um, they reached out to, uh, did some research across our country to connect with um, other school districts and communities that were in the same boat and wanted to see how they themselves were able to build a more connected community um, to, their, uh, uh, to their school district and so, and build that trust in that relationship. And they found uh, Nashville, um, uh, Alignment Nashville, which is located in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, an orga uh, uh, organization that had done exactly that. Um, they had through community support and aligning with their uh, school district, they were able to increase their graduation rates, um, build uh, relationships with employers, with high school students, um, and really build trust amongst the entire community. And so they shared their practice with us. And so we became the second alignment community across the nation. And now there are about 15 alignment communities um, across our nation stemming from the East Coast all the way out to Hawaii. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we able to really do that with fidelity? Um, uh, yeah, the next slide, please. Yep. Um, is really with our structure. Um, so we have uh, our governing board um, who consists of our school district superintendent, um, major key stakeholders um, and policymakers and funders. 
And those folks consist of like our mayor, um, our, our Winnebago County chairman, um, the top leaders of the largest employers um, within our community, um, all of the leaders from our local hospitals, um, and so on and so forth. They all, our, rock, our chamber as well, they all sit at that table and they really focus in on the funding vision, um, strategic plan, the fidelity and the policies of Alignment Rockford. Um, and so then who reports into them is the operating board and our operating board is really tried and true and really focuses on peer accountability of alignments work and our, and our alignment team and volunteer teams work. Um, they really you know, help with ensure that whatever pilots that we um, push out into our communities, um, that they're of quality and fidelity and that they truly are going to be impactful. They are a keeper of our alignment process, which I'll talk about here later. They consist of uh, you know, chairs and um, vice chairs, vice presidents of committees um, at this level as well. We have um, high school level, uh, or excuse me, Rocker Public Schools administration um, that sit at the level as, at the table as well. Um, action oriented leaders, community leaders, um, and um, really uh, high level decision makers as well. Um, sit at this table because they really help to um, expand Alignment Rockford's network um, and uh, help us bring even more people to the table. Um, I also wanted to point out that, you know, all of our alignment teams are co-chaired by a Rockford Public School District staff member, one of leadership that is able to drive decision making internally into the schools as well. And then it's co-chaired as well by a community leader. So we have community voice and school voice at every team level. Next slide, please. So what we really talk about a lot, and I'm sure you guys have seen this um, through our work and through our process, is that what we want to do is to really focus on is on systems change. Um, so a lot of our work with our continuous improvement process a lot of our discussions um, that are happening at our governing board and operating board levels, making sure that we're focusing on what's happening below the waterline and holding us accountable to really ensure that our pilots are, are really focusing on the resources, building relationships, um, changing power dynamics, and ultimately changing the mindsets of the folks in our community. So um, we really, really try to hone in on you know, understanding what are the conditions holding problems that we're working on in place and try to, and try to develop solutions around them. Next slide, please. When we do that, understanding that uh, what we bring to the table as alignments is not programs, but a tool set. And it's this five-step continue, I call it the continuous improvement process, um, being very intentional about how we craft and draft pilots um, that will ultimately be um, instituted and absorbed within our community, either with our school district or um, with another entity within our community to lead the charge in sustaining um, the work. Um, so we have five steps. First step is tactical planning. Um, and research. We really paint the why and the needs that we feel that whatever strategy um, that we deploy, why it will be impactful, uh, best impactful and suited for our community and for our students. Um, we talk about our outputs, our outcomes, short-term, mid-term and long-term um, measurable outcomes. And we also talk about how we're going to collect that information and data and do that. We talk about sustainability of of, of the pilot as well. So thinking long-term beyond the pilot, how will this work continue? What resources are needed, whether it be talent or funding um, and really work towards ensuring that um, this, uh, whatever we push out, it also can be um, sustainable. We invite our community to the table along on the journey. Um, so we're sending an invitation to participate to our community um, to help us work and um, execute our pilot. Um, once we push that out, 
we hear back from our community and we select organizations that we feel are the best fit um, to lead the charge uh, for this pilot. There is a, there's an implementation and evaluation phase. Um, like I said, we measure short-term, mid-term and long-term outcomes of this. And if we consistently meet uh, those outcomes, we talk about scale up. Um, so we start small and then we start to scale up uh, our pilots as well so that we're not you know, trying to you know, eat a whole grapefruit all at once. We take it bit by bit by bit, making sure that we have the value, the, the resources available um, and the skill sets available in order to make it work. And once again, once our community decides that this is something that definitely works, we need to keep it. The school district is like, this is amazing. Um, we need to hold on to this activity because it's serving our students and our community well. We then hand it off to the appropriate um, institution to keep that going. Next slide, please. So during all of this, what are we? Like Nancy said, we're cheerleader, we're coach. We're making sure the train stays <laughs> on the rails there and doesn't go off track. Um, but we facilitate the entire discussion of the five-step process. And it's hard. It's hard to have, you know, especially when you want to, you have your own opinions. It's hard to like, you know, be the facilitator, but we're consistently facilitating, encouraging folks, saying, you guys, I know it's hard, but we can do it. We can figure this out, um, but it's going to take time. Um, so we're consistently doing that as well as um, along the way, we are definitely um, praising our community partners um, and our volunteers in this work along the way and celebrating our wins. Um, we are the keeper and holder of our process. So we know our process inside and out and making sure that we adhere to that in this work and our, with our volunteers. Next slide, please. So another component um, that we were here to share is to really talking about um, equity in our work. Um, and I will say and admit that, uh, you know, we haven't in the past um, really been as uh, hyper-focused um, in terms of equity in our work as we're trying to, you know, we were trying to grapple with, you know, just pushing out pilots. But I will say here recently, um, we've drawn out from our guiding principles uh, the, the reasons as to, or, or I, I should say like our guiding principles will started when the alignment started over 10 years ago. And it's funny how it's all coming back to, to, uh, to our remembrance of like, actually equity is in our guiding principles. So we should have really have been focusing on this from the beginning. And there are three, uh, three principles that really encourage us and should hold us accountable to ensuring that equity is a focus in our work. And the first one, a next slide please, is enabling children or is focusing on those with the greatest needs. Um, if you're focusing there on the most vulnerable children um, to begin with and letting that be the target, not the, the easy wins, but you're focusing on the harder ones, um, that's really truly to me showing equity in our work, that we are not here to build a system um, for the easy ones. We're starting from the hard conversations and then working our way towards, you know, um, uh, towards the more easier ones. And so um, I was just, you know, once again, pointing this out to our operating board and governing board um, about a year ago of like, you know, equity is in our work. It's, it's in our guiding principles. And so we should really make sure that we're really leading the charge in those and highlight, highlight those. The second one is ensuring that we're um, not just focusing on academics. The next slide, please. But we're targeting um, the whole child. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we are intentionally bringing people from under other industries to this work. Um, so it's just not an employer that we're bringing to the table. Um, we're being, bringing, um, you know, nurses and doctors to the table. We're bringing uh, social workers to the table to help us design solutions um, that focuses on the end, the whole child. So we're talk, having the converse, conversations around social emotional health uh, in our youth when we're crafting 
work-based learning experiences and others uh, for our youth. We're being really intentional around the DE&I conversation in our work and with our employers to ensure that when kids do connect with them, that kids are seeing people who look like them um, in, their, in, their, in their place of work. So um, once again, uh, targeting just beyond just what we fill those, those hard skills and academics. And then lastly, um, really you know, ensuring that um, we understand and our, this is our, our guiding principles that this is comprehensive and not multifaceted. There is not one way to skin a cat um, and not one size fits all in our work. And so we shouldn't approach our work that way as well. Uh, we wanna ensure that our pilots work together and not against one another um, in our work, um, whether it's early childhood or college and career readiness, um, because we want the largest impact. So once again, we bring multiple industries and voices to the table to ensure that um, we have the most impact in our work. And one, you know, one here recent training that we've had through a grant that we just received on our early childhood side, we were able to receive. Um, some training from Greater Good Studios around human-centered design. Um, and once again, the human is the center of our focus, of our work. We're designing for human beings here. We're not designing for a robot. Um, so we have to be very intentional on how we craft that design. Um, and then the next couple of slides, I just kind of wanted to point out some aha moments for us. In that training, they talked about what good design was. It design is honest reality, um, meaning that lived and learned experience needs to be addressed and brought to the table and a part of the discussion. Um, and so it's how does our work honor our community members reality? And I'm sorry, COVID really this year really helped us to really laser be laser focused on honoring people's reality in our work. Um, and being able to understand that. And then really focus in and be intentional about whose voice is missing from our work. You know, we, we talk about it, like, you know, we look at the table and whose voices is missing, but we always seem to go to the expert or what we deem as the experts at the table and not really listening to the community as a whole. The second piece was good design creates ownership. Um, so people adopt the change that they're a part of, that they help to build, that they help to design. Right, you know, it's giving them an ownership of their community. And so we wanna, you know, from this point on be really um, intentional about creating ownership um, with our work and in, in, in our solutions that well, we design. And then the last one, which I think was really, really powerful for me was that good design builds power. And they spoke a lot about how traditionally solutions are designed for people and they're designed with the people with the um, who feel that they have the most power um, and the people with the least power are often closest to the problem. And they are they really are the ones that should hold the power. And so the next slide kind of shows talks a little bit about what you know the you know definition of power in this work is really the ability to prevent and maintain or create change. And I think about our students. You know, how many of our students are really sitting at the table helping us to draft and design our solutions, right? But you know, they um, they're at the center and the human that we are designing for for this work. Um, and so also really being understandable and intentional that power asymmetry is often it's lopsided. Um, so how do we help to build power with our students and our work? And how do we retain decision making, um, elect all that decision making power from um, our institutions? And so the, this last slide on it, and then I'm gonna get off the soapbox about power <laughs> and who has the power was this diagram here is that this is where the power is usually lies in our work and how we really need to shift that dynamic and bring and invite an open space and allow space for the folks on that other side, on the right side to be a part of the conversation 
um, to help build ownership and help us really design the solution. So we're really focusing on adding student voice, adding more community voice uh, to our work going forward. And I've I've, I've kind of I've kind of kind of said here like so our, our our teams aren't moving forward until we have these voices at the table. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't move forward with our work. Uh, so our, our teams are recognizing. So just a little bit about our, our A teams here. Um, like I said, we, our alignment teams, we focus in on early childhood and college and crew readiness. Um, I'll talk a little about like, you know, what, uh, what um, a little bit about what the, what the teams are working on um, and then how we've kind of pivoted here in, in COVID. So um, our, our alignment teams, um, we kind of broke them up into buckets, you know, exploring, you know, that's the tactical planning phase, what, you know, what strategies, what best practices um, do we want to go research um, that could probably help us um, develop pilots um, to, to solve some of the, 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 some of the district's woes and our community woes. We have two teams that are, or that are part of that are ready to learn. Um, which is focusing on kindergarten readiness. Um, and underneath that ready to learn movement and, and pillar, um, we have about five alignment teams in that structure and over 150 volunteers working on um, ensuring that our kids are prepared for kindergarten. Um, and then uh, we have industry councils uh, as well, uh, working with our police, police departments and our fire departments to increase diversity of applicants. Um, and, and hopefully up higher uh, to those, uh, to that industry here in our community. We have our change teams who are, you know, already in pilot phase, and that's our, in our job shadows as well, and a couple of industry councils. And then our Academy Expo, which is our career exploration event uh, for ninth graders, which has like been a the whole machine uh, going forward. But all of this, you know, was great, and it was halted for COVID, right, a meeting in person. And so one of our biggest wins, this is on the next slide, is that for college or career readiness, we switched a lot of the things that we did and what we recruit for and do in person to, to virtual, to virtual activities. Um, so now all of these, this, this is all of the work-based learning that we would do now and help to recruit for, to connect with our students virtually from guest speakers. Um, we have weekly uh, virtual career panels with different industries live on YouTube. Um, we helped to recruit virtually for mock interviews for students. We also helped uh, the school district this year launch a senior mentor program to help our seniors stay connected and to help them ensure that they graduate. So um, we helped to recruit for individual mentors for students who were at risk and needed that extra connection and boost um, with, uh, to keep them engaged and ensure they stayed on track to, to graduate. And then we also built out career awareness videos. And if we go to the next slide, um, Anisha, I just want to do a quick time check. We oh, have about sure. 10 minutes left. So. Oh, okay. So our career awareness videos, I think the last, next slide is the last slide. Our career awareness videos, um, we had over 60 partners um, develop three to five minute uh, videos um, just about their career. Um, they're on YouTube. We've so far, we've had over 6,000 views. We've gotten really rave reviews, but it was, a, it was an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, still connect the world of work with our with our students in lieu of in person and our academy expo, and like I said, our kids have really really enjoyed it. But it was another creative way for us to stay engaged. Thank you very much, Anusha, uh, uh, Anisha, and I will turn it over to Daryl. Um, and I'd like to try and make sure we get through his presentation and probably have a time for one or two questions. So, Daryl. Over to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, congratulations, Nancy. I didn't realize you were the executive director of whatever the organization is called. <laughs> you show me the nexus next. Um, and um, Nisha, thanks for sharing what Rockford is doing. So I see they saved the best for last. So I uh, will do my very best, or at least the best for the most brief person, which is not me. Um, Moore is a um, regional effort in Northwest Illinois. If you want to hit the next slide. This is kind of gives you an idea of where we are in Northwest Illinois. We uh, are surrounded by, um, uh, what do we have there? Five or six different counties. And we, we are a partnership. I'll go ahead and hit the next slide. Uh, here you see some of our partners. So we have higher ed, SOC, 
Morrison Tech, uh, several chambers in the region, um, several school districts, the Career Center, and the Career Center uh, hosts 18 area high schools. So you can see, again, this is a definitely a regional uh, partnership approach and unique to, uh, I think, some of these other settings, but certainly similar as well. Next slide. Uh, those are just the high schools that we work with. So again, you can see how spread out we are throughout the area. And I would say that every high school has some part to play in what we do in some, sometimes small, but sometimes larger. So when we first, when I first came together with uh, this group, I went to the very, uh, I think it was the second 60 by 25 meeting in Springfield and uh, came back to the area and said, you listen, man, they're doing some really cool things around the state uh, by bringing uh, partners and organizations together. So we said, let's do this and give this a try. So we did, and so we were brand new and we said, what do we wanna do? So we, we had some agreed upon um, goals and we wanted to identify and help our employers and we wanted to um, help our schools and we wanted to keep the talent local as you can see. Um, so these were some of the things that we saw as potential areas that we could support. Go ahead with the next slide. Uh, again, our job at all times was to connect students, schools, and employers. And so uh, whether that be higher ed, uh, manufacturing, um, banking, uh, nurse, or uh, medical, allied health, we were always trying to, and you just felt like we were the ones that could connect the dots. Go ahead. So these were our core activities. We first wanted to, we worked with the Career Cruise Inspire program, uh, which no longer exists. And we've transitioned that to Zello. So each of the schools use Zello as a, uh, a career pathway organizational tool. And we're learning more about that each, each time. Again, this is our first year with Zello. So we have hired folks who go out and work with the area high schools to help them uh, get more out of the Zello program. And that was important. We always felt like we wanted to, you know, add value to the partnerships, both the schools and the employers. Um, we started, uh, uh, we, we didn't start this, but SOC and um, the manufacturing um, employers in our area had started some, a multi-craft program in intern. So, so our job was to, um, promote, promote, promote. So we connected, again, the employers in our regions to SOC and to the multi-craft program. And they have expanded that to WACC, which is the White City Area Career Center as well. Um, again, just today, as I, I shared earlier with some folks that um, we are in the, we are in the, we are in the, this, this will connect to some later slides we are in a conversation stage of how do we get a registered high school apprenticeship program into the multi-craft um, programming that we already have at the Career Center in SOC. And it takes an employer to really make this work. And so we had an employer contact us about a week ago that said, you know what, our, our corporate has said that we need to explore and we need you to offer us an apprenticeship um, option for the company. And so they sent us that email. We were like so excited. Uh, a week later, we were all meeting together talking about how we can make this happen. And again, we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, we happen to have some connections in, in Moline. And I know they're doing some work with a CNC um, registered high school apprenticeship program. And so they sent us their their model and we'll use that as a starting point. So again, it's just knowing people and working together and, and sharing ideas is so important. Um, the other big focus we had was expanding dual credit, both uh, at Morrison Tech and SOC and any of our colleges. For a while we were working with Western and still are and Northern in some ed pathways. So dual credit was a big, again, we, these are agreed upon 
value added um, activities that everyone can participate in. Um, our regional grants allowed us to work on transitional math, which our high school offers and many of the high schools in the SOC in our, in our, um, our region offer. Uh, and we started to work with, again, regionally with uh, an education pathway, which we have three students graduating from Fulton. Morrison has two. I think we might be one of the first in a smaller rural region to get the education pathway off the ground. And um, we have those students um, working on that. And again, uh, I guess I repeated the dual credit. So uh, go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, thank you, Daryl. I just want to note we have a couple, only a couple of minutes left. So Great, I don't thanks. know if folks are able to stay on for just a couple of minutes so that we can wrap this up. Thank you so sure. much. Sure, okay. Um, I, I sort of talked about our pathway work, so we can move on to that, move off that slide. What makes it all work? I think this is the important part. Willingness to think about your area as a region and not individual goals is so critical. Uh, being willing to share resources and staff, critical. Again, we have SOC, the Regional Office of Education. They all send people all over the place. WACC, our career center. We share a lot of resources. Um, our employers, we, they see a real benefit and they're willing to participate with us. And um, we love the support that Ed Systems and state initiatives have provided. Without uh, our willingness to go after these grants and them offering the grants and the grants being available, um, we wouldn't be able to do this work. Next slide. Uh, so this is just an example of a problem we had. We were able to bring some four area schools together to come up with a um, kind of a cooperative for, for dual credit that was hosted at one school. SOC sent an instructor to one of the schools and then four other schools sent their students to that school for what we called the SOC block. You can go on. So again, just regional, um, who does what? Oh, where are we at? Yeah. Uh, rural schools have some opportunity, you know, it's, it's just unique. I, I appreciate the flexibility and how quickly we are able to get things off the ground and do things. And I would say that's because uh, if we don't look out for our own interests, nobody else will. And I say that both um, regionally and within our school districts. So we know that we're, we're going to be able to accomplish more working together. Uh, go ahead. Um, so we talked about who does what. Again, I, it's just such a great uh, partnership. Like I said, SOC, president, vice president, the ROE, uh, district superintendents, district principals, district staff, all have been willing to uh, partner and jump in. Um, and then when, when there's um, a special interest from a group, we let them take that on and lead that. And um, but we will be cheerleaders and support any of those initiatives that they come up with. Go ahead. Mm, my role is to connect the people and bring them together. I generate the agendas and so, um, and also to update and share. Um, I enjoy doing that. I feel there's, I'm adding value to um, our region and, and I quite honestly, it, it provides a lot of, um, um, I, you know, I'm proud of the work we've been able to do and it, it's motivating uh, to me as a leader to keep doing it. It's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, if um, uh, we continue to be successful. What have I learned? To be selfless, to be patient and to be willing to work, share the workload. You can't do it all on your own. And so um, those are just really important um, concepts, being patient, building trust. If you go to an employer and say, we've got something for you, you have to, you know, sort of follow through on that. COVID has allowed us to be more creative, more ingenuitive, and huh, have fewer meetings. We used to meet quarterly. We've met a little less, and there's a lot less travel, but again, there's good and bad with this. Um, uh, so we've, we've found some things that are valuable uh, and some things we want to keep, and we want to move 
you know, back to some other items. You know, certainly our meeting today was face to face, and that really helped us get a lot accomplished. One of the partners was able to link in remotely. Again, that worked for them. They couldn't get out to us in time, but we're able to link in. Uh, go ahead. Um, here's, you know, we've talked a little bit about equity and we could spend a long time here. We, again, as a, as a region and a group, we work hard not to exclude any group. However, I do think we could try and focus more on um, being intentional about who we're and how much we're promoting these programs to and try and get um, more people on board. The challenge for us is that really it's the school and the employers who have to, to reach out to their stakeholders. And we, I personally can't tell an employer who to reach out to and who to try and support. I can't tell the other schools who they should be reaching out to and trying to target uh, for value and adding um, benefit to the, their students. But I certainly can do that amongst my own groups. Thanks, next slide might be it. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, Anisha and Daryl. And I apologize that we didn't have time for questions but you have their contact information. And if I can speak on their behalf, I know they'd be more than willing to um, connect with you directly to answer any questions that you might have. It's three or four, and I just want to be respectful of people's time. So please reach out if you have any questions and thanks always for the important work that you're doing. <laughs>